Uh. Ooh, yeah. Drop that beat. It's time to meet DP. So, welcome everybody to the first episode of DP and Me. I'm DP. Who's me, you're wondering? Well, that's going to be my guest. That's, that's when you say something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was laughing at the title. Um, okay, so some people know me as Armac21, some people know me as The Waste of Time, some people know me as The Bald Ass. Uh, my name is Marcus. <laughs> yeah, but we're, I'm just going to call him Mark because... Yeah, that's we're true. online friends that probably will never meet because, you know, that's how that goes. Mm. So anyways, this is the very first episode of the DP and Me podcast. And so, Mark, you mentioned all these different names like uh, The Waste of Time and R Make 21. Those are really old ass names that I haven't heard in a long time. Maybe you can introduce some people as to what those actually mean. Okay, so the waste of time is my my I guess you'd call my current YouTube account. And in the past, I was known for being a very angry individual who screamed and yelled at video games. I was around back when it was common to see people doing like quote unquote reviews or parody reviews or whatever you want to refer to them as of like bad Nintendo games. It's kind of like angry video game nerd. Back when I was doing it and other people were doing it, he was actually just the angry Nintendo nerd. That's how long ago that started. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, there were so many people back in the day that played out those angry reviews. I mean, I, I can't even fathom the amount of people that were doing it at the time, which it's nothing compared to people who do YouTube channels now, but, I mean, there were so many people that we probably never even heard of when there we were, were doing it. <laughs> so there were so, many, there were so many people trying to remember everybody. It's just it's impossible at this point. So a lot of people just came and went. Some people stuck around. Some people stuck around for the right reasons, the wrong reasons. Uh, middle of the road. Uh, some oh, people yeah, for sure. inspired by other people, like you know. Apparently, my work and other people's work inspired, like for example, uh, the Spoonie Project. And apparently, based on what he said, irate gamer. It's not really a great thing to say, but he quoted it in one of his videos. Like, there's so many facets where it like literally split you know how they say the internet is a series of tubes like that screensaver well it was like that screensaver that's how many freaking accounts were popping up every five minutes yeah exactly uh but i mean it's just a crazy time but now the way i look back at it you know angry reviews i kind of consider that like the new metal or emo of youtube <laughs> <laughs> because like i mean there were trends that when they were popular, they were, like, really popular, and they were taking it over, but then everybody just got sick of it, and then they just make fun of it now. It's, like, a constant thing of mockery. I, honestly, if I compare it to a genre, I'd probably compare it to disco. It just needed to die at some point. It, it oh, was, yeah. <laughs> it's nice while it lasted, but after a while, you know, it's time to kind of move on and go, okay, we get it, the joke, you know? You know, that might be a better comparison because Disco does have some nice nostalgic tones to it. I really do enjoy watching some of the old anger reviews, even though I don't think I would really care so much nowadays for most people doing that. I mean, even when you get YouTubers like Angry Joe, he titles his videos as angry reviews, but yeah. he doesn't actually have much anger at all in them. <laughs> I don't understand. Some of those I don't get because he calls it angry review and then he talks about the game. He's really positive about it. I mean, there's, there's parts where, like... Even the best game can piss you off, but at the same time, he's pretty positive about a lot of games. But the title angry yeah. is just there, so you're expecting, oh, this guy's going to rage, and not really. Exactly. Well, I think it's more of a typecast thing at this point, yeah, because his pretty. moniker's Angry Joe, so, I mean, it, that's just a way that he can kind of differentiate his video from, like, several others out there. Pretty, Yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, I mean... Uh, it seems like things have been going pretty well for you, from what I understand. You haven't been really doing much online no, lately, I took, but... Uh, I took a big step away from the internet and all the, everything that was going on at one point. You know, went out, enjoyed life, eventually met a female. Me and that female, we got married. Or that, why am I saying female? That woman. <laughs> Me and that woman got married. I'm happily married now. Have my own place, full-time job. Didn't know. Yeah, things are going really good. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, I guess everybody's got their own perspective on how the Internet's going to go. I mean, I've always been kind of on the Internet off and on, but I mean, know, I, I still, at the same time, I still work. Gotta, 
the internet. I just didn't get involved with anything, and it helped to just keep a distance. Like, just, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I guess just to watch from the stands as opposed to, like, getting involved in the wrestling match. It's easier just to watch and enjoy it as opposed to trying to dive in every five seconds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have... I've always been involved, but at the same time, I like to step back as well and just see what is going on. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that for sure. Yeah. I mean, you've got to do what you got to enjoy. You know, some people like to create. Some people like to consume. That's the way I see it. Some people like to destroy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> not going to name any names on that one, but... Uh, no, no. So, anyways, uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that are listening like, well, that doesn't answer anything about why we haven't heard anything from him in, like, two years. But, well, I mean, I, mean, I could give, I mean, there's, another, there's other reasons why. For one, when I changed my uh, my tech here, it became a pain in the ass to actually make videos due to the screen resolution changing in Sony Vegas with its updates, screwing a lot of settings up and my presets and everything going bye-bye. And YouTube constantly changing the their, their settings for their videos and the audio quality being kind of... Uh, like, if anybody saw one of my, the most recent video where I think I was trying to review Bombshell, which I wasn't doing a very good job with, or just playing it or whatever the hell I was doing, like, the audio, you could barely hear me over the game and then vice versa, and I was trying to fix it, and I just got so, I was so fed up, I was like, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I just went off. Yeah. And I, was like, I, I, I thought that was kind of weird. I, I remember seeing the video in my subscription feed, but when I clicked on it, it said it wasn't available. So I guess you already figured out that there was something wrong with it or something. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen it. Yeah, like 50 or 60 comments about the audio, and people were trying to watch it on their phones and stuff. And I was like, well, why are they trying to watch it on their phones? Now, you know, somebody who watches YouTube vids for fun at work on my phone or during my lunch break or whatever, I realize, okay, audio can sound different based on the device you use. And unfortunately, because of the sound, whatever the, whatever sound chip this freaking laptop I have now uses... Audio can be kind of screwed up, so it, it just it became such a mess I couldn't deal with it. It was getting such a headache from it. It wasn't anybody's fault, and it was like, you know what? I just I need a break, and that was that was kind of it. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I pretty much consume about ninety five percent of my content off my phone because I uh, actually have YouTube Red, which a lot of people hate on because oh, you got to pay a monthly subscription. Well, I mean, a lot of people will pay people for Patreon for like, stick <laughs> all. So yeah, that's that's every damn service nowadays. I have Netflix. I have to pay for that monthly. I don't care. Yeah. I use it. I mean, the way I, I it's worth it to me just because I watch so much YouTube. I don't have to worry about ads. And yes, I mean, you can use AdBlock on a PC, but then you kind of feel like if there's a content creator you actually enjoy watching, you kind of feel a little bit guilty sometimes that like. You're not really contributing to their ability to continue to make that content, that and then it is interesting um, you mentioned about ads. Um, I was watching uh, what was it? Uh, I was watching one of Matt and Pat's videos, and there was like an ad every 30 seconds. I'm not kidding around. One for Coors Light, one for car insurance, and there was one for I think another beer company. And it just kept doing that every 30, 40 seconds for a video that was I think like 12 minutes or something. And I couldn't figure out why they kept playing so many damn ads. And maybe that's YouTube's way of saying, yeah, time to get red, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you actually, I don't know if you know this, but whenever you monetize your videos, I don't know if every channel can do this, but I know some channels can. Like, you might have to be part of a network or just be a popular channel. But you can actually manually place ads in the video. Oh, I did not yeah, know. and then when you get someone like the Game Theorist, you know, that's a huge YouTube channel. They've got, like, what, 6 million subs or something like that. And, uh, you know, they, they get millions of views of video. You know, people, everybody, everybody knows Matt Pat. Uh, I'm personally not a fan of his, but <laughs> that's oh. another subject entirely. <laughs> no, no, um, when I say Matt and Pat, what I was trying to watch, I'm talking about the uh, Two Best Friends play. I was watching Oh, oh, uh, be- oh okay, okay. I was I, watching... I thought- uh, I was watching the, the one where Matt and Pat are playing Cabela's Shadow, Shadow of Cat which okay. I actually bought later on after that video to check it out myself because I was so curious about that game because it looks so looks so awesome but so bad at the same time. I had to see what the actual experience of playing it was like, and it was more entertaining watching it them play it than me playing it myself, to be honest. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. For some reason, I didn't hear the and. I just heard Matt Pat. I don't, know why, I refer, I I don't know why I refer to him as Matt and Pat because... It's now it's super best friends play. I think Liam left. But there was there was like four of them at one point. Originally, it starts as just them two goofing off playing video games, and I found their band to be hilarious. Like the back and forth between them, you could tell they're friends and they get along really well. And then they yeah. run in Wooly, and then there are other people, and there's a girl in the background of one or two of the videos. They never really explain. I think it's Matt's. Uh, yeah, I think it's Matt's girlfriend, if I'm not mistaken. But there's there was just this like 
I, their dialogue reminded me of like the good old like I guess you call the good old days where things were just fun. Mm-hmm. But now I think they do like full let's plays and stuff, but I'm not sure. But I love the old video regardless. Xbox Live Indies yeah. being one of my absolute favorites. Yeah, let's plays is uh, another thing that um, it's kind of like an angry review. It's something that unless you're already popular and established, you're not going to go anywhere with that. Nowadays. I um, like. I tried. I tried to. I actually was trying to legitimately do a let's play of the darkness a long time ago. And anybody who saw it briefly on something awful forums knows that I was actually legitimately trying to follow the rule set and everything. And the one complaint was that I just talk too much. But the but in terms of presentation, the way I presented it, like episodically, like you know, last time on or whatever, people really liked that. So I kept that in my later reviews. I would do coverage of video games. But it was tough. Yeah. LPs, is, I give people credit who can do like nice LPs. That takes a lot of work and effort. Yeah, I don't know. I, I personally don't watch Let's Plays anymore myself, really. I mean, maybe I'll watch like a part one of a Let's Play just to see what the person's personality is like and um, see what the game is like, if it's a game I'm not familiar with. But I don't watch them through anymore. Research indicates that, um, I believe that was his name, he did an LP of uh, Jurassic Park, Trespasser. Oh yeah, his, between I his that. voice, between his voice and the way he presents the content, I thought I was watching something that was made by an absolute professional. Oh yeah, I remember that. Let's play. That is a top notch one for sure. Oh, I man. watched the whole thing of that. So good. But uh, but I don't know. It's just nowadays I really don't. I'm I don't really gravitate towards that type of content. I'm really more of a fan of vlogs and reviews and things yeah. like that nowadays. I will only um, the only thing I'll the only thing I'll occasionally switch over to is there's this one account that I watch uh, sometimes walkthroughs of no, not even commentary and he was doing one of the Last Express or the person was doing one of the Last Express and that's a really hard PC point click adventure game and we just actually played it I think it's on iOS now and Android as well uh, watching him watching this person play through it and get past the parts I got stuck on and, and seeing how the story evolved even though it's a really old ass game I was like mm-hmm. this game is really underrated. I was totally enjoying it. Well, speaking of uh, games that you've watched, what have you been playing <laughs> lately? I recently was given by a coworker slash friend uh, a copy of Neo for the PS4. I've been really enjoying my time with that. Oh, Neo! Yeah, I've really have not had a chance to play the final version, but I really dug the alpha and beta. I've been playing a lot about that. So, can you tell us about your experience okay. with Neo? <laughs> okay, so I was actually initially I, I wanted I wanted to play Neo a while back. Like I remember playing the Alpha and getting my ass kicked, but having a good time regardless. I love the setting. It reminded immediately of like Onomusha, you know, Capcom, the mm-hmm. game series you completely forgot about. Um, it reminded me of Onomusha, but it was hard as balls. I remember that much. I kept dying constantly, and then I realized, okay, this plays kind of like another series, which is you know Dark Souls or as Bloodborne and stuff like that. But it's fast. Oh yeah. It's, like, it's way faster paced, and then I realized, okay, the guys behind Ninja Gaiden did the did the game, so the combat system feels more Ninja Gaiden-y to a certain degree. It's it's, it's basically the same thing as, as like what you'd see in Bloodborne and Dark Souls and games of that ilk, but faster paced and with changes and balances that are stuff that's different. And there's the biggest difference is probably the stances you can take with the weapon. You have a low stance, a medium stance, and a high stance. High stance does the most damage. It's the slowest. It leaves you the most open to just get annihilated. Medium stance is like just regular attack and defense and stuff like that. And then low stance is your quick attacks. And you could change that shit on the fly, depending on the situation you're in. And all the weapons have three different stances. And all the weapons can have like upgrades and stuff that will change the balance of that weapon. Like I just recently unlocked this, uh, a kick move I can do with my uh, staff. So after I do right. my combo, I can break into that kick and then break the enemy. They get taken out for a second, and then they're on the ground trying to get back up, or they're stumbling, and I could just initially launch into attacks afterwards and just annihilate the hell out of them. And it can oh, actually yeah, do that to groups, so it's perfect. Oh, yeah, that stance system is really nice. And like you said, you can change it on the fly. So you can actually oh. open up a combo with, like, say, the low stance, get a couple mm-hmm. of quick hits in, kind of like just to take a quick poke at the enemy. And then maybe when you stun them, you can hit them with a heavy attack to really. It's it's really important. It. It's really important too to change your stance because there's a lot of um, unlocks where you if you change your stance mid attack or when you're doing damage or whatnot, you can actually regain key back more key if you change your stance in real time. It's tr- the timing is incredibly tricky. But well, that plus that uh, key pulse or whatever. I forget yeah, that. What, 
I think you hit like R one or something at the right time. You hit R one, and then if you change your stance, you can do you can get even more back, and there's a way to double that on top of that, so you can become like unstoppable for like a minute and a half. Yeah, I know the stamina system. I when, from what I remember playing it, like obviously if you ran out of stamina, the punishment of that was like more severe. Oh yeah, than most other games like that, but. At the same time, if you knew what you were doing, you like would never run out of stamina because no, you could you, just if you run out of stamina, you're fucked. There's there's, there's no getting away. If you run out of stamina, your character stops dead in his tracks and is heavily breathing for one or two seconds. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if you got more than one enemy coming at you and they're ready to attack, you're gonna swarm. Mm-hmm. So you have to oh, yeah, because, balance everything out. Because you can't even dodge. I mean, similar games like Dark Souls, even if you're out of stamina, you can still do your roll dodge. That is true. The thing is, though, with uh, with this, the thing I love about this game is on top of seeing the enemy's health bar, you can see their stamina gauge. So what you can do is they can do their attacks and try to, and you get in close and then you dodge around them. Your stamina is already built up. You're behind them. They're halfway down on their stamina. It's going to slowly raise up. But if you can manage to get them to do, try to do two or attacks or do multiple attacks in a row, they completely drain themselves and now they're open for multiple hits. Right. Because I remember it's the easiest uh, way to kill enemies. Because you can actually do more damage per hit whenever they are drained. Plus, you can also do like the finisher attacks too whenever like they're like that. Yep, as long as you unlock them. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, personally, the most recent game I've been playing is uh, well, this is a game we're going to talk about a little bit later. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I want to kind of do a mini review of Hellblade: Sinuous Sacrifice. It's the latest game from Ninja Theory. I mean, everybody that knows about Ninja Theory, we're talking about Heavenly Sword, Devil May Cry, the remake, as oh, well as Enslaved oh, okay. Odyssey to the West. I love that game, uh, except... <laughs> Ninja Theory has been a company that, like, every game that I've seen of theirs, I've been really impressed with, mm-hmm. but it seems like when you look at the gaming press as a whole, it seems like the opinions on their games are very polarizing. Like, I don't know what it is, but... It seems like they can't really come to a consensus with their games. I, it kind of bugged me. I remember playing Enslaved and like really enjoying it. But then I got mm-hmm. to the end, and when I got to that very unsatisfying conclusion, I mean, it makes sense in the context of the game. If you play through it twice, it makes more sense, because you catch things you might have missed the first time. Once I got to the end and a very unsatisfying ending happened, I was like, eh. And then it just sort of like, I like the game, but I felt like it just lost so much because of that, that it was like, okay... Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Like this but, was a good I mean, game, but what I recommended to somebody because they get to the ending, they might break the game. Just going to have to be so aggravated because it just has some frustrating moments. And it's like I don't know. Right? Because I mean, they've always had this weird thing where people get really polarized over their games. But whenever I play them, I don't see what the problem is with them. Really, you know, like I mean, they make really solid titles, and Hellblade is undoubtedly their best game yet. I think. I forgot um, they made Heavenly Sword, to be honest with you, and I remember one thing about Heavenly Sword, the production values on that game for its time, its facial animations, everything about it was just mm-hmm. some of the highest you could find, and it was excellent. They actually took the cutscenes and the game and made it into a movie that I oh, yeah. saw on Netflix, and I remember actually seeing somewhere else. I was like, wait, I was like, that's a video game. And that's how high quality that shit is. It's like the soundtrack to Lair. It's like you don't see that very, you don't see or hear that shit very often in a video game. Maybe nowadays you do, but back then it was like, what the fuck? Yeah, exactly, for sure. Uh, so, for anybody that doesn't know about this game, Hellblade, essentially what this game is, at the very core, it's kind of like an adventure type game. You're playing as Sinua, she is a Viking warrior. Uh, that is trying to rescue a loved one from the depths of hell because I guess he apparently uh, lost his life and she's trying to bring him back. But there is a twist to the whole. But there is a twist. What? The moment you said I thought of Dante's Inferno, I don't know why. Dante's Inferno. There's definitely themes of that in this game for sure. Uh, This game definitely touches on several layers of that. But, Does it get um, as disgusting as Dante's Inferno, where I had to, I was like live streaming people, me and people were getting so grossed out by some of the visuals, I just stopped because I was just like becoming offensive. Oh, there is some freaky stuff in this game for sure. There's like uh, I don't really want to get into it. It's kind of spoilerish. I want to kind of just talk more about some of the general themes of the game. 
Okay. So the twist to the whole story is that Senua, at least as far as the developers have told us, suffers from mental psychosis. Oh. And this is a really interesting theme because this is not something that video game developers ever really touch on. Not even movies really touch on this kind of subject matter very much. And so a lot of the uh, subject matter that we see in the game, the developers actually try to, I guess, try to do their best to simulate what someone that suffers from this kind of illness would be seeing or hearing uh, or feeling, you know, and even in, in some cases. That's interesting. I mean, I yeah. suffer from... A lot of people actually don't know this. I don't think I've ever really openly discussed this. And it's only been a recent development in the last several years, but I actually suffer from a, uh, from epilepsy to a degree, and I occasionally have seizures. And right before and after those seizures, I see and experience some weird, weird shit that I can't even verbally explain. Mm-hmm. So now I'm really curious to see how this game handles anything, like anything where you start experiencing weird shit you can't explain, because... It's one thing to say, oh, it's Silent Hill's weird, but to see like a uh, real, like real, like them taking real accounts and putting it into a game, that makes me even more interested to play now. Mm-hmm. Kind of well, like, like well, with PTSD and fucking Spec Ops: The Line. Right, right. Well, something like uh, Silent Hill, you know, it does have like freaky elements, but they're 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 entirely surreal, you mm-hmm. know, at the same time. And this game does use a lot of surrealism. And, well, no, uh, I meant. I meant how Silent Hill draws on the psychosis of how the main characters and their, like, personal demons and stuff, like Pyramid Head and everything in Silent Hill 2 is just, they're, they're from James, and his, the fact that he can't have sex with his wife anymore, the fact that he feels guilt, and he has longing, and all the elements around, that's why the game's a masterpiece. All, everything structured around the game is all based on his, base of his psychosis and his mental slow but steady mental breakdown. Okay, you're talking about the original Silent Hill, right? I'm talking about the uh, the second one, which I didn't appreciate until I got older. <laughs> oh, Silent Hill 2, yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure if... Uh, yeah, when you said James, I was trying to piece... James uh, Sunderland, I think was his name. Oh, okay, yeah, he was the protagonist in 2. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a theme that is not often explored in games or any kind of media, for that matter. Uh, but I think this game did a really good job of it. And the... Uh, team at Ninja Theory, they actually teamed up with uh, various mental health experts to kind of, like, be analysts for the game, essentially. Like, they were advisors that helped contribute to the project and, you know, kind of helped them shape and influence the way the game would handle those themes. That's only been done. I've only heard of that being done one other time, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they <laughs> even had uh, people that apparently uh suffer from mental illnesses also help with the production of the game because they like actually like kind of sat in a panel and they would like check the themes out of the game as various times they actually did have a documentary that comes with the game that you can watch that explains about all that stuff although obviously for spoiler reasons you don't want to really watch that until you beat the game obviously yeah (laughs) because it it, it'll have all kinds of stuff throughout the game that you're watching you told me about it I watched uh, one or two trailers. I remember the game being in production. I did not know it was going to be released digitally and only for like I think thirty dollars for the price. What I saw visually in the trailers and one other gameplay video I watched like fifteen minutes of the actual gameplay. I was like, this looks rock solid. Like this looks like it's a buy almost immediately. Like even if mm-hmm. these, well, even if uh, there was an issue, that I'm sure we're going to get into. Um, it just looks really really good. It looks like something I'm definitely right. going to play. Sure. And I like Ninja Theory's games, so that also counts. For sure. I mean, graphically, it's not the best-looking game. I mean, it's really a rock-solid title overall, but it does have, like, a few areas here and there where the textures are like, eh, that looks like something off the PS3. Like, they could have definitely did better with something like that. I have listened. I played Aliens Colonial Marines. (laughs) Nothing could be more... You can't can't get more low-res textures than that on the next-gen console. Unless you're playing Minecraft, but... (laughs) You know what? But Minecraft, as visually lacking as it might be, is a really fun game. So it's the gameplay over the graphics again. Exactly, yeah. I got you. Um, But the thing that's really impressive about this game is the sound design. Um, Between the uh, minimalist score that it has, 
but it's whenever you get into like combat situations and such, it really amps up, and it has just kind of like a really creepy f- soundtrack in, as a whole. Like it's definitely survival horror kind of music. Good. And um, soundtrack way to go with that sort of theme that you just, that you described. Like I would not have a booming bombastic soundtrack like. God mm-hmm. of War, for example, I would not. Oh put yeah. that. I know she's supposed to be of the Viking lineage, but I would not put something like it in that. If there's a lot of like internal struggle going on, I would keep it more minimalistic and only ramp mm-hmm. up what time calls for it. It makes it more impactful too to have a great score that's very minimal. But then there's those moments because they'll stand out so much more, and people remember that moment. Versus if this whole soundtrack... I'm not saying amazing soundtracks are bad. I'm just saying if you have a minimal soundtrack with a couple of really key notated songs that are like really stand out and are great. To me, that's the sign of amazing sound, like amazing sound design, amazing choices made with sound, like placement yeah. and audio choreography. Right, and then also the voice acting is top notch. Like, I fucking really do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean the voice acting is just top notch, and it, they do it without using any like huge voice actors that they overpay for, like Troy Baker or someone like that. You know? <laughs> so, as a matter of fact. Um, the character that Senua is based on is actually somebody that works with Ninja Theory. They just use one of their own employees to basically model and portray after the character. And she does probably one of the best motion capture performances I've seen. I've seen, like I said, I saw a bit of it. I saw the, like, the movement of the character and stuff. It looked great. I still can't believe yeah. that's quote, unquote, a budget title. It does not look like a budget title. Right. Well, the whole reason for them making it a budget title is because they're self-publishing the game for one. Like, I think Ninja Theory kind of got blackballed by the industry after oh. the whole uh, DMC thing, because even though it wasn't at all their fault, like, the fans are, like, really upset about how they made DMC, and Capcom just pretty much signed off on it and was like, yeah, just do whatever you want, pretty much. Can I just, and they kind of, like... Can I just say something about that? Look, I sure. know it's not Dante, I know he's not eating pizza... I know it's not the same. It's not the same Dante we know. I know they even make it poke fun at it at one or two points. But at the same time, if you actually played DMC Devil May Cry, which is I don't know why they call it that, but if you actually played that game, it's a really fun game. Yeah, the characters are kind of annoying and obnoxious, but I'm playing that game to beat the shit out of everything, not for engrossing storyline. Which it has a mm-hmm. little bit of story that you may not see coming, but a lot of it is kind of predictable and stupid has been pointed out by a lot of reviews at this point, but it's not a bad game. It's oh, yeah, not, not worth not at all. slamming it got by a lot of people, and a lot of people were just pissed because it's not the Dante they knew. But have people forgotten how bad Devil May Cry 2 was? Exactly, you know, it's like... And what about Devil, Devil May, Cry. May Cry 4? You don't even play as fucking Dante in that. You play as this wholly different character. Not a bad game, but it had some really annoying-ass segments in it. I remember there was one platform segment almost made me quit the damn game entirely. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's like when people didn't get upset about... uh, like It'd be like if people didn't get upset about Metal Gear Solid 2, which it's a total, uh, like, striptease. Like, oh, you Snake in a new adventure. And then, like, oh, I'm playing as this other guy for the entire freaking game, and he's a whiny cunt. Here's the thing, that's not why... Okay, that was one of the the reasons I didn't like that game that much back way when. My other reason was, the storyline was so batshit crazy at the time when I was playing it, and I was expecting more of what I knew from Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation, that I was like, what the fuck is going on? What are they talking about? What is this madness? Later, you know, as I got older, I got used to Kojima's madness and started working it in. But if I go from Metal Gear 1 to 2 to 3, I'd rather just jump from 1 to 3 and skip 2. No offense, Kojima, I just don't like Metal Gear Solid 2 that much. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody, every great has their occasional missteps. I mean, uh, clearly, clearly, uh, he's inspired by Stanley Kubrick. Oh yeah, and, yeah. but Stanley Kubrick hasn't had all gems. No, he has not. And honestly, when it comes to Metal Gear, uh, fucking Metal Gear Solid Five is technically it's so it's phenomenal. But in terms of gameplay, ugh. oh, I love the gameplay of Five. I can't. I'm, maybe it's just me. I'm just sick of open world games in general. Yeah, for sure. But um, anybody that's even remotely interested in Hellblade, I definitely recommend it. Uh, I didn't even touch on the combat, but the combat is rock solid. It's very simple. It only uses five buttons. You don't have complex combos or anything like that to worry about. Hmm. But you can pull off some really intricate freaking fighting on in that game. Like, it's some of the best, like choreographed fighting I've seen in a game, too. 
Um, it does get a little button mashy sometimes, and the enemies can be yeah. a little bit predictable. Uh-huh. But when, you know, at the beginning of the game, the combat's pretty easy. But you get near the end, you can be like surrounded by like five enemies trying to peck at you, and That's, it I mean, gets fucking, pretty intense. Fucking near automata has like shit like that where it becomes almost button mashy. There's so much crap going on on screen, and it never once screws with the enjoyment of that game. And based on you recommending yeah. this, I'm definitely pick this up at some point, and I think other people should too. It's Ninja Theory. It looks great. DP's vouching for it, so I'll vouch for it because he's vouching for it because he has great taste in games. So yeah, Usually. And it's, <laughs> and Usually it's, again, I have good taste in games. It's, it, well, we all have our hits or miss. I like to f- fucking look at me with Alone in the Dark. Looking back on that, was that really, you know, no. It was me being more pissed off at reviewers than anything else, but not the worst yeah. thing I've played. But, yeah, no, yeah, that. Hellblade. I would, I would recommend it, especially since Ninja Theory made it. I love their games. Even if their games are flawed, their games are usually very memorable. Heavenly mm-hmm. Sword is definitely one of my favorite games they've made. I will say that much. So if they made it, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, definitely check it out. It's kind of funny. I said that was a mini review. I think that's probably been about half the podcast so far. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth talking so, about because you're so yeah. pat- you have a lot of passion towards it. So it's worth going over why it's worth checking out. Sometimes it's just it's worth to regurgitate the same thing a couple of times because people might miss the fact that, no, this is really good. You should try this out. I do so, that in the darkness like a few times, and then people finally play like, wow, that was really good. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I think we're going to go ahead and go just slightly out of order from what I originally planned, and I want to go ahead and go straight into the whole save file controversy of this game. See, like, whenever the um, developers, uh, they put a message in the game that... Mm-hmm. I guess apparently made the gaming press uh, seem like that the game would erase your save file. Which, whenever I heard about this, I was like, that sounds totally like Eternal Darkness, you know, pretty much. Which this yeah. game does have some similarities to, I would add. Uh, but that's mainly because they kind of touch on some of the same subject matters. But anyways, uh, the gaming press kind of took wind of this and spread this rumor that this game would actually delete your save file if you failed enough times. And there's been kind of a whole internet shitstorm over this whole subject. <laughs> have you read up on it? Yes. Yes, I have. That's why I I'm mean, when you so say what do you, what do you think about that? Here's, here's the thing. I, I, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody who just wants to go in blind, because that's how I like to play games nowadays. I, I don't see how it affects anything. First of all, if you're dying that often that your save file gets destroyed, maybe it serves as kind of a, a lesson to be learned to not die so much in a game that I what I've read is really not the most difficult game in the universe to begin with. It also, um, I've seen other stuff where this sort of shit happened, or close enough to this happens. Apparently, you know, games where there's any sort of looming effect of infection or otherwise there's caustic effects on the gameplay. I've seen games where your main character can be wrecked for the entire game if you're not careful. They get to play the whole game as like a as a crippled ver not to say crippled in a disfigured way, but you get to see you basically your character does not have half the abilities they had for the remainder of the game, or I guess like Dark Souls when you go when you're hollowed versus like fucking unhollowed. You yeah, can play exactly. The game yeah. that way if you wanted to. Well, I mean, anytime you beat a boss, you go human until you die again, of course. But yeah, but yeah, like the whole save file controversy, it, it's a really interesting subject. I mean, because when I think about, like, how outraged people got about this supposed uh, theme, like, a lot of people said that they weren't going to buy the game at all. They weren't going to play it at all just because it had that feature. Who posted the first article about that? Uh, I don't... I don't was know it if Kotaku? It was, it was, like, Kotaku or PC Gamer or Fucking someone like that. It probably... This is the thing I'm thinking. It probably was Kotaku because they love to do this shit because they love to spur internet bullshit because it gets them web hits and it creates, like, a a, a fucking stream of nonsense that rips from the shreds of that whatever article they post. They're notorious for doing this sort of crap. Yeah. Them and and Polygon. Those are, like, the two I can think of on the top of my head that love to talk shit. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, Kotaku does have some interesting discussions from time to time. I do check this stuff out, but... But I don't know. I guess... You know they gotta they gotta get that traffic right. I mean they gotta put some yeah. clickbait out there. Yeah, it's it's all about keeping the uh, lights on, I suppose. <laughs> that is true. That is really Especially true. with the whole uh, Gawker thing, which I, I, I <sighs> isn't Kotaka owned by IGN now. I think they're owned by IGN. You know what? I'm I pretty don't sure because uh, the whole Gawker thing. You heard about that lawsuit that Hulk Hogan had with Gawker 
Yes. And he apparently won that lawsuit, and they awarded like $140 million or some shit like that. I was like, and Gawker's really not that big of a website, so that pretty much tanked them. Well, they're owned by, um, people, a lot of people forget this, but there's a couple publication publication companies that own pretty much everything. Anybody who read gaming magazines back in the day knows that Ziff Davis was the name that was on the bottom of those magazines. Mm-hmm. They own yeah, they, all of that. <laughs> yeah, they had like um, GameSpot and stuff like that too, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. GameSpot's yeah. one of the biggest... I mean, they, they weren't for a while, and then, you know, when they returned to form, when the Giant Bomb people came back, mm-hmm. like, that was a big thing, and they made a lot of fucking money in the process. Yeah, for sure. But um, the whole save file thing, it kind of reminds me of playing some of the classic NES games that didn't have, like, any continues, or if they did, they only had, like, maybe two continues. And then if you don't get through the whole game using those lives and continues, you have to start from the very beginning. So it's kind of like a return to that. Or although <laughs> although apparently the whole save file thing turns out it was actually a bluff, because I think it was um, Game Informer. They actually put that to the test, and they, like, intentionally died 50 times through the game. And they were still playing the game. Like, the rod or whatever that grows on your arm, like, if it does have any growth from dying, it's, like, super minimal. Like, it's really hard to notice. What actually causes that growth is going through the sequence of events in the game. Yeah, makes sense. So, uh... So I guess that was kind of the issue. Now, I don't know if the game has multiple endings or whatever based on the number of times you die. Maybe it does, but it seems like this one's kind of a, a total bluff, and I'm just surprised people really fell for it. I'm just surprised that people reacted to it, period. That's what shocks me. It's like, really, people are getting upset about this? There's so many other features in certain games that could drive you insane, and this is what they're getting upset about? Yeah. There's always got to be something. I mean, how, how often can how you... Long is this, how long is this fucking game? Like, what is it, like, ten hours, maybe? It took me, I think, seven hours to go through. That's what I mean. It's like seven seven to ten hours. It's not that yeah. long as a game. If it's a 40, 50-hour quest to, or beyond that, okay, I could totally see people getting pissed off, but it's not... It's a game you could basically play through in one or two sittings. Right, exactly. And if you got to make multiple saves or something, I don't know. So um, I want to go ahead and skip back to what else we've been playing. I know you were telling me about some uh, PS1 games you were playing recently. What well, were those? I, I've been going through an archive of PlayStation 1 games recently. Uh, too many friggin' lists, honestly. Uh, most recently I was playing uh, Silent Bomber. Which I Silent feel Bomber? Like, God, I feel like game is so under... Most people don't even know what it is. The Silent Bomber is a PlayStation 1. It's not Bomberman. Though if you play it, you'll notice mechanics that are slightly similar... Long story short, it's basically... How do I describe this game? Imagine if Bomberman um, and a like, top-down shooter-style game had a baby with Hideo Kojima's style of storytelling to a degree, and you have Silent Bomber. It's basically... Oh, okay. There's a lot of storyline. There's a lot of like like dropping bombs and blowing enemies to Kingdom Come, but there's also a storyline about someone who does not want to fight in wars and a lot of drama and character development. It's just... Try, it, like, I can't do it justice by describing it because there's too many different genre mashups going on, but I highly recommend people check that out. They haven't seen that, played it, or anything about it. I was playing Rising Zan, the Samurai Gunman, which I haven't played in years, which is still stupid and fun as I remember being. Not a great game mechanically, but fun to play regardless. Uh, Brave Fence from Sashi, which is one of my all-time favorites. That's my first PlayStation game I ever bought, actually. Funny enough. Oh, yeah, Brave Sensor from Sashi. That's a really good game. That's kind of like... Square Enix's attempt at doing a Zelda game or something like that. I refuse to call them Square Enix. I call them when I refer when I play the PlayStation stuff. I just go SquareSoft. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. I, I can't I can't combine the two because of like how I remember them. I, I I can like visually see the case in my in in my mind's eye, and I'd like no, okay, it just said Square. It said SquareSoft on it. I don't like Final Fantasy right. like that. But it's um, kind of like yeah. it's kind of like trying to call Final Fantasy six or Final Fantasy three Final Fantasy six. I can't well, fucking we, do we it. Played it as, we played it as Final Fantasy 3 way back in the day. I played it as Final Fantasy 3, and that's what I'm fucking calling it. I don't care what the purists say. I'm, I'm not from Japan. <laughs> yeah. I go to Japan, I'll call it Final Fantasy 6, but when I'm in the United States, I'm calling it Final Fantasy fucking 3. So Just like I call I, it Earthbound, Earthbound, and not Mother... Uh, Mother 2. 2, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. by the way, Nintendo, for not bringing Mother 3 to the States. Yeah. They did bring the first Mother, though. 
I could see why they didn't bring the third one over though, having played a little bit of it. Right. Speaking of yeah, speaking of uh, speaking of missing out when I was younger, I did not play Earthbound when that game came out. I did not play it for years. I only just recently fucking was playing Earthbound and realizing mm-hmm. how genius it really is. So all the people going on and on about how it's the best game ever, uh, yeah, it's definitely one of the best RPGs I've played. Well, with when it comes to Earthbound, I really enjoyed the uh, story and the character design and stuff like that. But the yeah. mechanics, the mechanics even for that day are outdated. That is okay. That is true. But I noticed something else. It's never really unfair with the RPG system, which is kind of limited for the most part. A lot of people don't like RPGs when the enemy just appear. You don't see like your characters doing attacks on screen, you know, a la Final mm-hmm. Fantasy three, to give an example. But I actually like that first person view. I'm a fan of like first person dungeon crawls with RPG mechanics and stuff. But I can see what you mean. What makes Earthbound stand out for me, like you, for you, is just the storyline, the character dialogue. It's it's still funny to this day. Like I was laughing at stuff that I didn't even know if I should be laughing at because how old the game mm-hmm. is. But no, it's just it's char. You know what it is? It's charming. That's the only way I can describe it. It's got a charm about it that a lot of games do not have. Undertale was the last game I remember being that like feeling the same like charm from. And no, I didn't right. finish under so No goddamn spoilers, please. Yeah, I get, I, I get that. You know, I was actually talking. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with Magus X One. Yes. Yeah, he's actually uh, a pretty good friend of mine now. I actually met him in person. But anyways, he actually had a really interesting discussion about Earthbound. Like he's he kind of feels the same way I do about it. Like he really does dig the story and such, but he just thinks the mechanics are so outdated and terrible even for that era that that's why he is yeah. a huge fan of the game you know he's i kind of wish earthbound was a point and click adventure game to be honest yeah i think it would really work in that kind of format it should think about maybe doing a redux of that game one of these days and changing stuff up i mean it could still stay an rpg i don't mind but yeah it just feels like maybe some minor changes here and there might do it some good because like a a lot of the character and the charm that it has, that would totally work in a style similar to, like, say, the Lucas Arts games. You know, that's what I anyway. kept. That's what I kept being reminded of over and over again, and then I kept thinking, like, what kind of art style? And I'm thinking Day of the Tentacle. I'm like, Pfft. yeah. Or shit, so, Willie. We change Willie Beamish around to have aliens and stuff, and there you go. <laughs> right. I mean, besides like uh, Hellblade, of course, I've been playing the new Splatoon two. Which, it's it's pretty good, you know, I mean, Splatoon is fun. Uh, Splatoon 2 is pretty much a more of the same kind of game. Like, you're not really getting anything new, new, but you are going to get new maps and weapons and things well, like that. Just, just kind of mix it up a bit. It's it's Nintendo, it's like, what do you mean? It's kind of like, right. like it's DLC, well, like it's full price. <laughs> well, yeah, it. but I mean, like, you go from, say, like, Super Mario 3 to Super Mario World, like, even though Super Mario World is a sequel... There are a lot of differences between the games, whereas with Splatoon versus Splatoon True. 2, they're very similar. You know, they're, it's more like what you'd expect from, say, a sports title update, where they'll add new things and whatnot, but it's the base game's pretty much the same. I'm trying to... See, that's the thing. What about visually? Is it more impressive than the first one, or is it the same thing, kind of? Um, there is some differences. Uh, it does seem like it has like a sharper appearance. Uh, the paint looks better, like, the way the light hits it and stuff like that, it's more realistic oh. looking. Because uh, I played Breath of the Wild, I know what the Switch can do. Right, and I think it, I think instead of going 720p, it actually goes up to 1080p, but from what I understand from Digital Foundry, they use, like, a adaptive resolution thing, so uh, it'll fluctuate the resolution a bit, but it does so to maintain a steady 60 frames a second. Well, I... That's so much irony there, because Neo does the same damn thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, Neo which, cannot... by the way, uh, Neo, if you play that on the PlayStation 4 Pro, you can get that 1080p at 60 frames. I know. I, I don't have the Pro. I have the OG PS4. Yeah. That's, that, that, <laughs> actually, that makes... I, have the de- I have the Destiny PS4. I actually didn't get that. Oh, okay. The Destiny one. Well, so, would you get rid of your original one? I remember you got it near launch. The original one? I forget. <laughs> Oh, did it I can't remember what the hell happened to it, but um, that was gone, and then I didn't have a PS4 for a long time. And then, uh, I don't know why, a group of people online contacted me, and they were asking me a couple questions about games I wanted to play, and then lo and behold, one was fucking sent to me. Nice. A special edition one, no less. To this day, I have no clue how that happened. I don't know how I got the GP, GPD XD either. That was sent to me by somebody in Hong Kong. No one has my address, so how the fuck are they getting me this stuff, was what I asked myself. And I'm like... 
Okay, I have somebody a has it. And my and my Wii, my Wii U as well was bought for me by random people online, and I didn't ask for it. It just kind of just showed up. I was like, "The hell is this?" And it's the fucking Wind Waker. Wii U knows. Yeah. So, so. I wish I had people doing that for me, but I have to resort to I, resort to screw over GameStop. <laughs> I don't want I don't want people to do that. I want them to I want them to just you know get themselves games or save their money for things they want. I don't want people to feel like they have to send stuff to me or anything like that. I mean, I work a job for you know reasons to buy this stuff, and. If you have so many games already, like I do on Steam and other platforms, it's like, you just gotta play what you have. And then once you finish all those, then you could consider you know, getting something new. But I do, exactly. don't get me wrong, I do appreciate those, I do appreciate everything I just mentioned. I'm not like I'm looking at it and it gets horse in yeah. or anything like that. Not how it should read. The Switch, exactly. however, I bought that for my wife. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. And then other than that, I've been playing, uh, I just beat the original Darksiders, the War Mastered Edition on the PS4. As well as, uh, I'm playing through Darksiders 2 right now. I think I'm more than halfway through that. Those are really good games. Um, I, I, I beat Darksiders 2 before, but this was the first time I beat the original one. Very nice. Uh, but, um, I mean, anybody that likes games like Zelda, God of War, uh, Soul Reaver, those kinds of games, that's what these games pretty much are. They're pretty much a mishmash of those games. So if you like even one of those three, you're probably going to dig this game. Or these games, because there's more than one. <laughs> but needless to say... Darksiders uh, 2 is a great game. Uh, Darksiders 1 and 2 are great games. Darksiders 2 is like very underrated. In my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they play a little bit differently. I'd say the original Darksiders is more of an action platforming adventure kind of game. Darksiders so, 2 introduces some more RPG mechanics and stuff like yeah. that, although it, it's pretty basic RPG mechanics. It's not like you have to worry about... Um, all, you know, intricate details, but you do have, like, your weapons and things like that that you can upgrade and, uh, you know, just mis mismatching your equipment to try to get the best build possible. Yeah. What are they called? Item item conveyor belting? Or this, this is a term they use for it. Now it is time to take a break for everything that people wanted to talk about, and let's talk about the news nobody cares about! And welcome back to the news nobody cares about. <laughs> because there's a whole bunch of gaming news that nobody really cares about, but they still report anyway, just in case somebody does out there. Uh, first of all, did you know they're actually making a new NBA Live 18? EA is still trying to make basketball games. Like, wow, who even thought about that? You know, like, when was the last time you even played a NBA game from EA? Like, <laughs> for me, it was probably, like, what, the PS1 or some shit? <laughs> NBA Jam was the last one I played. Oh, yeah, NBA Jam, forgot about that. Well, besides that, pretty much. But, you know, they shit. haven't been relevant in the basketball game in a long time. And why don't they just make an MLB game? It's not like Xbox yeah. has any good baseball games at all. They can make a <laughs> killing off of that. But no, let's try to compete against 2K and constantly get demolished. So, anyways, there was a video showing the graphics comparison. The graphics do look a lot better if you're one of the five people that buy NBA Live 18. <laughs> so, there, take that as you will. And then, of course, in Nintendo Switch news, Nintendo Switch gets a bunch of game releases of old-ass indie games that everybody's already played. But the twist <laughs> is they're getting physical releases. So you get games like uh, Super Meat Boy on a nice Switch chip, which is really nice. You know, if you're a collector mm -hmm. and things like that, I definitely Great recommend game. that. But uh, at the same time, if you haven't played it at this point, like, are you ever going to play it really? I mean, come on. You should. <laughs> if you <laughs> haven't anyways, played that by now, yeah. That and Binding yeah, exactly. of Isaac, if you haven't played one of those, you need to do so now. And speaking of physical releases, I don't know if you knew this, but the game Night Trap that originally released on the Sega CD is actually being re-released for the PS4, Xbox One, and PC. As a matter of fact, they recently had a limited run of this today, and naturally it sold out in like a minute because limited run makes like 20 copies. They're stressing the word limited in that title right there. These things are going fast. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Even though like every other like small publisher that I've dealt with like that, like I am eight bit and fan gamer, they actually do pre orders for this stuff so they can actually gauge like the amount of people that want to buy it and then manufacture it. 
Whereas Limited Run's like, you know what? People don't like these old shitty games. We'll just make a couple of thousand <laughs> copies. And then, like, they sell out in a minute, and then everybody bitches about it online. And then they get sold on eBay for $200, which... They, I think, would night trap it and anticipate well for this one. They should have known. The nostalgia for that game is humongous. It's not, well, a, consider- not a great game, but in terms of nostalgia value, yeah. <laughs> well, considering that uh, Wonder Boy, they had a physical release of that last mm-hmm. week, and it sold out in, like, five minutes. And that was, like, an old Sega Master System game. I mean, who even had a Sega Master System, right? I but- forgot this- <laughs> exactly. But anyways, if you want a physical copy of Night Trap, hit up your local eBay, get the Sega CD copy, don't pay the scalpers. And yeah. then, of course, uh, Surgeon Simulator developer, they have announced a new game, because in case you ever wanted to do a cat dating sim, check out Perfect <laughs> Date from them. Wait, ex- wait, excuse me? Is this like Hateful Boyfriend, where it's all pigeons? Yeah, except it's cats, because you know, everybody loves cats. Cats oh, are the most popular God. thing on the internet. My wife's going to want this fucking game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most definitely. And then we, of course, got Sonic Mania. We finally found out what the file size for Sonic Mania is, because anybody that's got Nintendo Switch has to worry about file size. <laughs> they have no memory. But in case you're wondering, is it going to break the bank on your Nintendo Switch? It's not going to really be too much damage. It's only 186 megabytes. I mean, were you guys really expecting much? It's not... It's... Here's the sad thing, I've barely followed Sonic Mania. It's it's just 2D Sonic, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like Yeah, so a, how much space um, could it possibly take up? Exactly. I guess maybe people thought that it would have some kind of FMVs or something like that, but I doubt it with that kind of file size. They jammed FMVs into cartridges way back when. I'm sure they could find a way to jam an FMV in there and not take up a, like a fucking gig worth of space or something. Yeah, but back then we watched on uh, old CRTs with crap resolution. Nobody's going to want to watch that on a TV. Yes, TV. but there's the, <laughs> see, there's the brilliance of it. They could put a crap FMB in there, and they'll just be like, oh my god, it's so retro. Oh, yeah, make it watch like a... Uh, watch, watch the Sonic CD intro on the original Sega CD. Oh, yeah, the Sonic just, Boom or whatever. If, yeah. not, if people are not sure what I'm talking about, watch it on there, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Or watch Night Trap being played on the original hardware. Exactly. And then, of course, uh, this Sky of Five has sold over 100,000 copies worldwide for the Nintendo Switch, because apparently there are, you know, people are just so starved for Switch games. Like, there's no games at all for this system, apparently, so well, they're no, like, oh, I see the Sky of Five, let's buy it. Who the fuck's going to pay that price for, like, Binding of Isaac and a few other ones on that? But the Sky of Five is a rock-solid game. You know what? I love Binding of Isaac, and uh, I'm going to defend that game. I right can't, here, right now. <laughs> I can't pay forty nine ninety nine for a hard copy on the Switch when I already own Binding of Isaac on multiple platforms as is. That's a ridiculous price. It's a great game, but fifty dollars in GameStop for a new copy of that? Are you fucking kidding me? Well, I'm not making one, this you up. Get a, you get a manual. Oh wow, a manual. <laughs> and that's for the news that nobody cares about because we, somebody's got to report it, but. Who hold cares? on, hold on, I gotta go to GameStop, I gotta go bring a bunch of these games back and go, I didn't get a manual, this wasn't worth 50 bucks. Yeah. So anyways, I don't know, if you've been catching up the uh, Kickstarters lately, there's actually a uh, new N64 controller that's coming out. I did not know that many people still own the N64s, that's what shocks me the most. Oh uh, really? I mean, that's like one of the most I, popular I, retro systems right now. But in terms of, like, actually being able to hook the thing up and everything, I thought people would just kind of go on to, and not, not that I endorse this, but I thought most people were doing emulation nowadays, but apparently there are a lot of people who still own the OG N64 and still play the damn thing, which I give them plenty of credit for because there's nothing more fun than four-player GoldenEye or Smash Brothers on that thing. Well, when it comes to the N64, some games emulate great, of course, like Super Mario True. 64 and such, but games like GoldenEye, like you mentioned, they, those games still have problems with emulators. So. That is... That is very Sometimes true. you have to go to the original hardware if you want to get that experience. And so there's a company called Retrofighters. They're actually releasing a new N64 controller that is kind of like a Frankenstein between the N64 and the Xbox One. And I'm really looking hyped for this controller. I've already backed it on Kickstarter. It looks pretty kick-ass. I kind of wish they were releasing something like that for the like like USB wise for PC or something because that would be the ultimate solution for me wanting to play Banjo and Kazooie and Banjo Tooie since I'm sad, true, but I never played either one of those and I kind of want to after you go oh, such a piece of shit. Yeah, you never played Banjo Kazooie? 
No, I did not. I didn't know. Here's the thing. I didn't own an N64. My N64 was given to me by a, a fan a while back. He actually brought it to my job because he was leaving New York. And uh, he's like, here, you can have this. And it wasn't one of the included games, but um, I was trying to get a copy of it. And it was so goddamn expensive to track down a real copy of that damn game and a few other ones that I wanted to try out. And it's just like, it's always been on my, like, to playlist. Because initially I was put off by like what looked like kitty graphics and stuff. I was one of those people. No, I want hardcore, violent ass games. But then I seen some people playing it. I'm like, this looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, that's not bad. So, anyways, if you're still playing N64 and you want a non shitty controller to play it with, get on that Kickstarter. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the N64 controller. Yeah, it's got yeah. a weird shape, but it works. It's but the analog stick uh, kind of breaks on you after three months and gets all loose. That's the see. That's the thing. You're saying that, but my friends. Controllers survived for years. Well, your friend clearly didn't play Mario Party in 64. No, we did. We did the, you know, that game where you got to rotate the stick back and forth, and, you did, and most people were doing it with their palms, where they wore their palms out. We had multiple blisters from playing that stupid game. Oh, yeah, that was Mario Party. Yeah, that was ridiculous. The analog survived. <laughs> the, C, the C buttons did not, though. So we're going to skip the topic after that, because they're really, I mean, Overwatch is a great game. Don't get me wrong. I mean, people can kind of look it's, into it. They're doing, like, a free-for-all thing, but it's technically I should add it to the news nobody cares about just because just, nobody's going to play that mode. It's deathmatch. Some people yeah. might play it just for fun, just to test out weapons and shit where they don't have to work with other teammates and worry about them making fun of them for trying random stuff. Right, like, but there's going to be certain characters that nobody's ever going to play on their, like, Mercy. Like, who the hell would play Mercy on a mode like that? Or, I don't... Uh, I, I honestly don't give a shit about a free-for-all mode. You know what I want? A fucking storyline mode, Valve! <laughs> The now Blizzard, rather. Oh, Valve. Oh, speaking of Valve. The uh, Blizzard, not Valve. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. But that kind of goes into the next topic, because Valve oh, they have recently announced a new game. I mean, everybody looks forward to the time <laughs> that Valve's going to announce a new game, and they're like, oh, it's going to be this game, or this game, or this game, with a three at the end of it. Nope. No, not this game. <laughs> <laughs> not this time. <laughs> so tell us about that. You want me to tell you about that? How Valve can't count to three? Okay, so it's one thing if you don't release, you know, one of the intended sequels that people are waiting tooth and nail for at this point in time. But when you take something like, uh, I don't know, massive a MOBA, and then I don't know, turn it into a card game, you might have problems. It's a bandwagon that a lot of um, a lot of stuffs jumped on. I'll admit to that. The card game thing phenomenon has kind of kicked off. You know, uh, Hearthstone, no, Hearthstone, excuse me. Hearthstone's pretty damn good, I gotta admit. I hate free-to-play games, but that's pretty damn good. And there's a few other ones as well, and this has become kind of a rising thing. That being said, um, my view on this is going to vary a lot more, because I actually like to play card games on a table with physical cards. I enjoy tabletop gaming myself, personally, so the charm of it is a little lost on me. That being said, Gwent just got made into its own separate game. I remember playing Witcher 3 and playing that for like two hours and forgetting what game I was playing, so I could see the appeal of these games. But not with Dota 2, and not make that your big announcement, like it's something big. Not to mention, they've shown nothing of the actual fucking game. It's all like just speculation and hocus pocus. Right, exactly. So, anybody that's wondering, they announced a game called Artifact, which is kind of going to be a digital card game, similar to Hearthstone or any of these other games. Maybe. Um, but it's based on Dota 2. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some similarities. It's least. probably going to be some free-to-play shit. That's my guess. Oh, yeah, for sure, no doubt. I mean, Dota 2 is a free-to-play game, so but it would really make sense to... But there's speculation, because Gabe Newell said that the next game they were going to make internally was going to be a single-player game. So now people are really wondering, like, what the hell this is going to be, and will this actually have? Will this actually be not what they expect, and actually be like a single-player like RPG with card mechanics or something? Well, they may be talking about their own internal studio. I think Dota 2 is actually made by another developer, and Valve just kind of bought them out or something like that. It is. And there's somebody attached to the pro the project. I can't remember the fucking name of the guy, but he left another like studio to work with Valve on this. So there's a lot of speculation in the air about this, but I will tell you this. The consensus for Artifact is not good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it could be a really good game, but... I. You know, anytime Valve announces something and it's not something that people's actually looking forward to, they're probably going to get it. What, freak? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Valve! <laughs> fucking... Uh, just make the fucking game already. We don't need advanced VR tech and hand gloves and bullshit you've seen in Tron to play Half-Life 3. Uh, 
Yeah, no kidding. And again, they never even made Sin episodes too. So, <laughs> what the fuck am I waiting for at this point? Uh, wasn't that who made that? Valve. I think. Valve Sin. made Sin. Sin wasn't made by Valve. Sin picked up. A Sin was picked up by Valve for episodic content through them, and they made Sin episodes uh, one, and then they never made the other ones to follow up on. Oh that. right, yeah. Well, it, that kind of goes, you know how that is. Uh, episodic games are not a good idea if your game flops the first time. <laughs> or they're not good if you can't follow up. Valve! <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I can't get over that. Epis- what, how many episodes did they make to Half-Life? Half-Life 2, what they do? Just episode 1 or did they make it to 2 and then stop dead in their tracks? Yeah, they did an episode 2. Episode 2 and I then think, they just uh, stopped. Yeah, I think the orange box came with both... <laughs> Uh, the episode yeah, 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 as well as yeah, the original yeah. Half-Life 2. And with Portal, which was... Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Portal itself was amazing. That's that's the three I personally want is Portal 3, because Portal 2 is mm-hmm. one of my favorite Valve games ever made. I would love to see a, I'd love to see a follow-up to Portal 2 that concludes it and gives more gives like the rest of the story. Because people have figured out a lot of information from Portal 1 and Portal 2 based on lots of like stuff lying around, and the science project mm-hmm. thing they hint off as to who you're playing as. But I want that, like, conclusion just to be satisfied in that all my speculation was either completely right or completely fucking wrong, and I feel like an idiot. Plus, I just want more of that crazy-ass mechanics, but I can understand why Portal 2 took a long time to make. And Portal 1, you got to remember, was just a game they threw into the orange box as quote-unquote filler that was made by, I think they were just students at a game development college or something. Yeah, like like interns and stuff. Yeah, it was was kind of like, yeah, just an extra. Like, here, check this game out. Became the like reason to own, it became the reason to own the fucking orange box for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, speaking of the orange box, I remember playing that originally on the Xbox 360. Mm. And the Xbox 360 had a little program um, that people could submit their own games, like really small indie games. They didn't oh, have to go no. through all publishing things. And that was kind of a popular thing on the 360. Well, it looks like that's coming back. Uh, looks like uh, for the Xbox One, they're coming out with the Xbox Live Creators Program. It's also going to apply to Windows 10 as well, so okay. maybe this will be a way to kind of sneak your way past Steam if you can't get approved there for some reason. No, no, you can go to Sony and release shit like the Black Tiger, or whatever the hell it was called on there. Or uh, <laughs> that... that was, well, the Gerstefern Open Window 2 or some shit. Uh, there's a game called uh, Skylight Free Range. That's it, Skylight Gash Free Range 2. Darth Serene or some shit like that. Oh my and god. I bought it. It has graphics game. like the original oh. Persona 1 on PS1. That's that's insulting to Persona. Persona 1 looks better than that. I, I actually bought that game because I had to see just how bad it really was. You, I cannot begin to describe the pure horror of that shit. I wish I had a way to record a playthrough of it because I would probably do that just so people could laugh their ass off all the way to the bank. Oh, uh, wait, which one? The Gash to Wing game? Yes. You actually bought that? <laughs> I got I got my hands I got my hands on it and I wish I wish I had a way to, to record it or play through it or something. I don't even want to do concert, I just want people to experience the depth somebody can go to make the worst one of the worst or the worst game, but it's so hilariously bad it's amazing. Like there's parts where there's cutscenes that happen where characters pass through walls, body parts don't match, arms invert when they're trying to attack, people fall down, they're supposed to be dead, they stand up, they fall down like fourteen times because it glitches out. It, it's so funny. And it's so vulgar and in your face too. Like there's tons of swearing and sexual content for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> and it looks like a sto- it looks like um a store a, a, what the fuck was the name of that game on the PC that had all like uh, like Alone in the Dark looking visuals the first one Astoria Astaria something Astatica I don't know something like that but it looks like that literally wow that's crazy man <laughs> but so the Xbox Live Creators program uh, I remember you wanted to say something about that because I was yeah, talking to you sick about media it. stay the fuck away from it we don't need any more of your ugly ass poser looking female <laughs> dating bullshit sims on Xbox <laughs> If you've ever gone on Xbox Live Indies and dug through the archives, you know about them, you know about Silver Dollar Games, and you know about the Sunburn Engine, and you know how bad it gets. Yeah. There, are, there were some good indie, don't get me wrong, there were some good Xbox Live Indie games, actually. Oh yeah, no doubt. I remember playing a few good ones. Um, like, they think they had, like, the Castle Miner or whatever, that was kind of like a good Minecraft spin-off type game. 
There was, um, there's one, there's actually one that's on the 3DS uh, eShop right now. I can't remember the name of the game. It's where you protect, like, a princess and you defend a castle. It's like a tower defense, like, RPG-style game. It got a re- release on the 3DS. That's a really good one. Yeah, and then I remember playing a really good roguelike where you actually were able to use your avatar on there. And so you had oh. your avatar moving around the map and stuff like that. But yeah, it yeah. was, uh... Kind of like NetHack in a way. Uh, what were some other ones? Oh, Super Amazing Wagon Adventure, which I played with my wife, actually. <laughs> that was an Xbox Live indie game. Oh, yeah, for sure. If you want to uh, if you want to see the worst indie Xbox Live indie games, some of the worst, check out the Two Best Friends. I mentioned that earlier. Check out Two Best Friends play at Xbox Indie Games 1 through 6, and you'll see what I'm talking about with sick media and stuff. Oh, yeah, Super Best Friends play. They fucking, man, those games are so bad. You'll also hear some of the best one-liners, like Ask for Days became a catchphrase one after watching too many of those videos. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I would have to check that out for sure. Uh, so, what was I going to say? All right, Pat, where's my paycheck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been great. But, I, uh... <laughs> but no, that goes that relates perfectly to this, because you'll see what happened with Xbox Indies, how there's one good one, and then there's just... Tons of crap. Also, a really good one that shouldn't have been good to mount your friends. For sure, for sure. So, I think it's time to wrap it up for today's episode of DP and me. Or is it me and DP? <laughs> I don't know. What to say. Yeah. So, but uh, I want to thank uh, Mark for coming on the show. It, oh, yeah. It's been a pleasure kind of catching up with you and Definitely. seeing everything that's been going on, you know, and. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen for the next episode. This is kind of like the pilot slash test episode, just to kind of gauge everybody's thoughts on it. So going to probably um, come up with a better title for the show. <laughs> so any suggestions maybe. for titles of the show, throw them in the comments. Yeah, yeah, maybe you can uh, make fun of us or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, I'm going to try to share this to iTunes for anybody that has iPhones, because everybody loves iPhones, of course. You know, the greatest phones in the world. No, <laughs> but if you're Apple not an iPhone my user, paycheck. but if you're not an iPhone user, I think I'm also going to put this on Google Play and Stitcher as well. So there's gonna be different ways to listen to it, and then of course YouTube because why not? Yeah. It's a free upload, so it's who fair. cares? For now. <laughs> so, but uh, I want to thank everybody for listening, all ten of you, <laughs> and uh, I want to thank Mark for coming on the show, and then we'll see who's on the next show. Uh, who's going to be the next me but I'm DP <laughs> and I'm out thanks for listening <laughs> okay I would like to thank you guys for tuning in to the DP and me podcast this is me DP down Phoenix and me today was Mark, a.k.a. rmake 21 a.k.a. The Way Zero Time. I would like to thank him very much for being on today's show. I also want to let you know that all the music clips you guys heard today came from Technoax. You can check out royalty-free tracks at youtube.com forward slash Technoax. That's T-E-K-N-O-A-X-E. You can leave a comment on this video at youtube.com forward slash down phoenix. You can also check us out on iTunes at The Down Phoenix Show, as well as Google Play and Stitcher. If you have any questions or concerns, just leave us a comment or email us at thedownphoenixshow at gmail.com. Don't forget to like us on iTunes so we can build this channel up for the new podcast. Uh, Once again, this is Down Phoenix, and thank you for listening. Down Phoenix South.